Okay, I call this meeting of the House Preventive Health Division to order. Uh, first item on the agenda is the roll call. So could the clerk please take the roll? Good morning. Chair Freiberg. Present. Freiberg, present. Vice Chair Bierman. Present. Bierman, present. Representative Grunhagen. Present. Grunhagen, present. Representative Acom. Present. Acom, present. Representative Abaje. Present. Abaje, present. Representative Carlson. Carlson, present. Carlson, present. Representative Franzen. Franzen, present. Franzen, present. Representative Heinzman. Present. Heinzman, present. Representative Morrison. Morrison, present. Morrison, present. Representative Pryor. Present. Pryor, present. Jerry, you have a quorum. Okay. Representative Ackland is present. Oh, my apologies, Representative Ackland. Very, my apologies. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, so a quorum is present. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the March 10th, 2021 hearing of this division. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, thank you. Vice Chair Bierman has moved approval of the minutes. Is there any discussion? Okay, seeing none, uh, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, please say no. Okay, the motion prevails and the minutes for March 10th, 2021 are approved. Uh, so we have some new faces as you may already have gathered um, in this division. So I would just like to um, introduce uh, some of the people involved in this committee. Uh, so uh, first, uh, a returning face, I believe, um, Elizabeth Clarkvist from House Research. Would you like to say hello or say, introduce yourself? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I'm Elizabeth Clarkvist with House Research. I'm the um, House Research Analyst that staffs this division, and I cover health department and public health issues. Okay, thank you for being here. Uh, next from GOP Research, uh, Lori Cousineau. Would you like to say hello? <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Lori Cousineau. I've been with the caucus for four years. I started in research in the civil law committee, and then I was in LA for three years, and I'm back in the research department for state gov and preventative health. Okay. Thank you. Glad to hear you. Glad to have you here. Sorry for <laughs> your name, Ms. Cousineau. No, nope, that's perfect. Yep, <laughs> okay. That's good. okay. Uh, next from DFL Research, we have Eric Anderson. Hello, everybody. Uh, Eric Anderson. I've uh, been with the caucus for a while now, covering commerce and a smattering of healthcare issues for the last uh, four years or so. Glad to have you here, Mr. Anderson. Uh, we have a new committee administrator, uh, Simon Brown. Would you like to say hello? Hi, my name is Simon Brown. I'm the committee administrator uh, for the Preventive Health Committee as well as the Commerce Committee. I've been in the caucus for about two and a half years now and happy to be with the committee. Glad to have you here. And we have a new committee legislative assistant, Mr. Seth Gelman. We've already seen, would you like to say hello? Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here, thank you. Okay, so thank you. Glad to have you all here. Uh, you really, it's really the staff that keeps uh, the wheels of committees turning. So um, it's great to have you all here. So we're going to um, have a hearing just talking about a couple issues related to lead. Um, we talked a little bit about this with uh, in the issue of lead paint uh, during a hearing last year. Um, but uh, there are other aspects besides the, the paint uh, aspect of it that certainly affect the health of people and constitute a preventive health issue. So I uh, thought we'd start with that. Um, we're going, we have several testifiers who are going to speak um, initially. Um, be because we have so many, I'm going to limit their time to two minutes each. And then uh, there are two bills on this topic that I just wanted to hear a little bit about. They're currently in the Environment Committee. So uh, rather than refer them on the floor, I thought I would just have the authors present those bills here on an informational basis. Um, it is possible we could hear them more formally later, um, but that is yet to be decided. But this seemed like a good topic to uh, kick us off um, for this year. Um, so uh, with that, um, as I said, we'll be keeping time. So I apologize if I cut in on you, but I do wanna make sure we um, 
you know, we're moving along and we have time to get everyone who's asked to testify here. Um, so the first person testifying I have on this issue is Jeff Freeman with the Public Facilities Authority, and then on deck will be Carol Henderson. So if you want to get ready, uh, uh, Carol Henderson, and then, um, but uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Freeman, uh, you have the floor first. If you could, and everyone just please, uh, for the record, please state your name and any affiliation you might have uh, for the record so that we can um, put you down properly. So uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Freeman, please, uh, please present your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Jeff Freeman. I'm the executive director of the uh, Minnesota Public Facilities Authority. We're the state agency that manages uh, state financing programs for water infrastructure. Um, the, the recently approved federal infrastructure bill, uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, will provide significant uh, additional funding for uh, all of our water infrastructure uh, programs that we manage. And there is a significant part of that that is specifically targeted to lead service lines. Um, we expect approximately $43 million per year for five years. Um, we are working with our, our partners, the Minnesota Department of Health. We manage this program in conjunction with them. Um, they are uh, uh, working on some changes to their project priority list uh, uh, point system to um, better rank lead service line projects. Um, we have actually started, uh, we were able to provide funding um, this past year, City of St. Paul for the first lead service line project, a fairly small project. And um, now we have several other cities on the current priority list and we expect a number of other pro uh, projects to come forward. And it's, it's not necessarily a, um, a rush to get on this year's list. There's an annual process each year and um, cities can apply each year for projects to get ranked on the priority list and then um, uh, request to be on our um, second intended use plan, as it's called, for projects that are ready for construction. The federal funds um, that I mentioned, $43 million per year, the federal law requires that 49% uh, of those funds be provided as uh, well, the term they use is additional subsidization, but essentially that means grants. The remaining 51% then would be as low interest loans through our um, revolving loan fund. Um, the, let's see, I think that, as I said, the process is an annual process. It starts with cities getting on the project priority list, submitting proposals to the health department and then um, coming forward when they're ready for construction. Uh, we have, this is significantly more money than we've had for uh, these lead service needs in the past. So we are looking at some uh, change to our state statutes for the program to essentially remove um, caps and limits. So allow uh, maximum flexibilities for cities to use these funds. I think I'll just stop there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Freeman. And um, I see Representative Heinzman's hand raised. Um, I think maybe we'll get through the testifiers first. There are 13 more, um, and then we'll have some member questions uh, after that. Uh, Representative Grunhagen, I see you've raised your hand as well. So Representative Heinzman and Grunhagen, you will be first on the list once we have uh, concluded the testimony. Uh, so the next testifier I have is, yes, Representative Heinzman. Well, everybody be available, Mr. Freeman, specifically after your testifiers have all spoken. I believe they should be, yes. If they're yeah, not, they're, I think we might be better served taking questions now. Could you please confirm that? Uh, they both nodded. Um, I saw, I saw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, so they will be. And yes, if and I'll just put in a request for all subsequent testifiers to stick around um, until the uh, 14 are 
uh, until the 14 testifiers have spoken so that uh, if case there are any questions for you, we can, um, we can, they can be addressed. So next uh, up is Carol Henderson and after Mr. Henderson will be Dr. Stephanie Yendel. So uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Henderson, please identify yourself uh, for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Carol Henderson. I served as the DNR non-game wildlife program supervisor from 1977 through 2018. The tragedy of lead poisoning in bald eagles has plagued me throughout my career. 48 years ago, I picked up a dying eagle dying from lead poisoning at the Lackey Parle Wildlife Refuge in Western Minnesota. That was 48 years ago. Now eagles are still dying from lead poisoning caused by the lead ammo used for deer hunting. They feed on gut piles that hunters leave in the field after shooting the deer with lead bullets. I estimate that Minnesota deer hunters annually leave about 140,000 gut piles in the field tainted with lead bullet fragments. That amounts to about 3 million pounds of lead poison gut piles affecting Minnesota's eagles and other wildlife. Eagles also feed on deer that have been wounded by hunters and not retrieved. Estimating a 10% loss rate for deer by hunters shot, shooting deer, hunters using lead leave about 14,000 deer carcasses in the field each fall, about another half million pounds of lead poisoned venison. 48 years have passed since I picked up that dying lead poison eagle. How many more years will it take to make the right decision? Non-toxic ammunition is now manufactured by all of our nation's major ammo companies. They know that non-toxic ammo is the ammo of the future. They are in competition with each other to produce the best, most accurate and effective ammo available at prices competitive with premium lead loads. If Minnesota takes action to ban the use of lead ammo for hunting in Minnesota, it will end a sad era of knowing that we are continuing to poison our national bird and allowing it anyway. This action will also solve another problem. As more citizens realize that hunters using lead bullets are poisoning bald eagles, it soils the reputation of hunters and give them a black eye. And I'm a hunter myself. Requiring non-toxic ammunition will help hunters restore their reputation as conservationists and also save our eagles from unnecessary death by lead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Henderson. Next is Dr. Stephanie Yendel, and after Dr. Yendel will be Dale Gentry. Dr. Yendel, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair, members of the committee. I'm Dr. Stephanie Yendel, Supervisor of the Health Risk Intervention Unit at the Minnesota Department of Health. I'm a veterinarian who trained in epidemiology with the CDC, and my team receives all blood lead test results from people tested in Minnesota, we connect people with elevated blood lead levels to services and conduct analyses. People of all ages can experience negative health effects from lead, but young children are the most vulnerable to its toxicity. Even at very low levels, lead can cause decreases in IQ and attention deficits. These effects may not become apparent until years later when children enter school and are challenged to succeed in the educational system. Lead can also cause a variety of symptoms, including anemia, high blood pressure, and fertility problems. The majority of blood lead tests in Minnesota are conducted on children who are one to two years old, and in-home environmental assessments are conducted for children with the greatest level of exposure. About 75% of these children have exposure from old lead-based paint in their homes, and contaminated soil is a common contributing factor. Other lead sources in this population have included lead brought home from a parent's workplace or hobby, imported ceramics, and items like fishing sinkers that are mouthed or swallowed. Uh, environmental investigations for young children with the highest levels of lead exposure represent a portion of the sources of lead, but no exposure to lead is considered safe. And exposure to lead uh, from water, for example, typically causes lower levels of exposure that would not trigger an in-home environmental investigation. Other exposures, such as consumption of venison harvested with lead bullets, are more likely to occur for older children and adults who are less likely to be tested for lead. But studies have shown dose-response relationships between these exposures and blood lead levels. Because no level of lead exposure is considered safe, Prevention is the key for reducing the detrimental health effects of lead from any source. Thank you.
Thank you for your testimony, Dr. Yendel. Next on the list is Dale Gentry, and after Mr. Gentry will be Seth Moore. Uh, Mr. Gentry, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Chair Freiberg and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Dale Gentry, and I am the Conservation Manager for Audubon, Minnesota. Now, as you likely know, birds don't have teeth. Instead, birds have a muscular organ in their gastrointestinal tract called a gizzard that many species fill with sand and small stones to aid in the physical breakup of their food. Unfortunately, lead fragments in the environment found in lakes from fishing tackle, found in trap ranges from practice rounds, and found in hunting areas and gut piles, and carcasses, and errant shots are indistinguishable from the sand and pebbles that birds seek out and are frequently ingested by mistake usually killing the bird. Just one lead sinker or shot is enough to kill a loon or an eagle. Now, while our iconic bald eagles and common loons are the species most closely tied with exposure to environmental lead, over 130 species of North American birds ingest lead through eating grit, through ingesting gut piles, or eating other animals that have ingested lead. This list is filled with waterfowl and upland game birds and birds of prey, many of the species most cherished by the sports people and bird watchers of Minnesota. Now those resistant to restricting lead have often asked if lead poisoning affects populations or just individuals, or if there's evidence that banning lead impacts conservation goals. Those valid questions were once left to speculation, but recent publications now show that mortality from lead does have population level effects as was found on loons in New Hampshire and that banning lead can lead to measurable population level decreases in blood lead level, as was found on black ducks in New Jersey. Our continent has 3 billion fewer birds than it did in 1970, and we know that lead is contributing to that decline. The impact of lead in our environment is undeniably negative, and we now know that restricting the use of lead can have positive and measurable impacts on bird populations. At the Audubon Society, we want to be a resource for bird science, and our calling is to protect birds and the places they need, which is why we support any reduction of lead in the environment. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, so next up is Seth Moore, and after Mr. Moore will be Victoria Hall. Um, Mr. Moore, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, everyone. My name is Seth Moore. I am the Director of Biology and Environment for the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. I'm here today to talk about lead toxicity in both humans and in wildlife. The Grand Portage Band is a subsistence community in northeastern Minnesota on the shore of Lake Superior and on the border of uh, Minnesota and Ontario. Our community hunts, fish and fishes, and gathers and I'm concerned about lead toxicity in wildlife, but also lead fragmentation from bullets into wildlife that can be consumed by humans. Um, I'll, I'll quickly share my screen and show a handout that we've put together uh, to help to promote copper bullet, um, copper ammunition usage by our tribal members. If you look at the image in the lower left part of this, uh, of this pamphlet, it shows lead fragmentation in a deer carcass. What happens is, is lead bullets uh, fragment extensively. They can be seen by x-ray. That's what those small particles are. Those are consumed by humans or wildlife and lead to lead toxicity in wildlife and, and in indigenous people as well. Uh, like Carol Henderson referred to uh, earlier, 50 years after he rescued an eagle with acute lead toxicity, I rescued one last winter. Um, it ultimately died of, of lead toxicity. Also, as Carol Henderson mentioned, uh, single projectile copper ammunition is extremely effective in terms of harvesting animals. The, the industry has done a very good job of, of replicating what lead ammunition can do, both in shot and in single projectiles. And I echo his request to have legislation developed for non-toxic ammunition as a requirement in Minnesota. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Moore. Uh, next up, I have Victoria Hall, and after Ms. Hall will be Andrew Slade. Uh, welcome to the committee, Ms. Hall. Please uh, identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Ms. Hall, if you are here, we cannot hear you. Rookie move after two years in this world. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Victoria Hall, Executive Director of the Raptor Center. 
1974, the Raptor Center has had the mission to rehabilitate ill and injured owls, hawks, eagles, falcons, and vultures. Our hospital admission numbers place us as one of the busiest Raptor Centers in the world, seeing over 1,000 wild patients this past year. With every bird that comes in broken and ill to our hospital, we learn more about what's happening in our shared environment. We've been tracking lead poisoning in eagles and other scavengers admitted to our clinic for decades and have found 85 to 90 percent of all bald eagles admitted have some level of lead in their blood, and there is no safe level of lead in any biological system. 25 to 30 percent of these birds will have fatal levels. So where do they get it from? Research has shown that in Minnesota, the leading source of poisoning for eagles and other avian scavengers is lead ammunition, especially used for large game animals such as deer. In particular, gut piles left behind create an incredibly rich and high value active meal for these birds like Max. One study from the 2012 to 2013 deer season showed that 36% of 186,000 gut piles tested in Minnesota had lead contamination. That's 67,000 point sources of lead just from that study tested alone. It only takes a piece of lead the size of a grain of rice, about half to one centimeter large, to kill a bald eagle when ingested. The effects of lead poisoning are devastated, devastating. The lead does permanent damage to an eagle's nervous and vascular systems, resulting in the bird becoming weak, unable to stand. It struggles to breathe. It loses awareness of its surroundings. It has seizures, becomes blind, and its heart muscles and valves are often damaged beyond repair and then it dies. The suffering and the death is completely preventable. U.S. wildlife populations are some of the best managed in the world, and it's enabled by our incredible hunting community. Some of the strongest environmentalists and conservationists that I know are hunters. They love the state, they love the environment, they love the animals, and they show great respect for those they harvest. A simple human choice, stopping the use of lead ammunition when hunting with firearms, helps protect all of us, bald eagles, our environment, and the people that use our natural resources. The Raptor Center strongly supports legislation that will support this and support the future of our state. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony. I appreciate it. So I think that's the first time I've had a live eagle on a Zoom meeting before, so nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next on the list, uh, and you got a tough job ahead of you, that's a tough act to follow, uh, is uh, Andrew Slade. And after Andrew Slade will be Helen Davis. Uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Slade. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Freiberg. My name is Andrew Slade. I live in Duluth, Minnesota. I work for Minnesota Environmental Partnership. Um, Duluth is a real classic Great Lakes Rust Belt community, uh, like Flint, like Toledo, like Chicago. Uh, for us, we have our clean, incredible clean lakes, pure water right out the door, and that's where our drinking water comes from. And yet, by the time it gets into our old infrastructure and piping to the kitchen tap, it's contaminated with lead. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Health has some excellent data maps that we've used, and they've, and they've shown year over year a couple neighborhoods in Duluth with high concentrations of lead in, in elevated blood blood levels, uh, the Lincoln Park area and Central Hillside area, uh, which, have, which correspond with areas of, high, of lower income and uh, um, uh, more ethically diverse uh, residents. Uh, knowing what's going on in the communities, our communities really want to engage in this, find out more. Uh, uh, including doing some really basic level of, of water testing. And so we, uh, MEP kicked off a real person-to-person, neighbor-to-neighbor water testing program of drinking water. Um, in our program, uh, we tested 52 homes. Uh, of those 52 homes, uh, 35 or 66%, two out of three had detectable levels of lead in their drinking water. Um, 10 of the homes had lead levels exceeding 10 parts per billion, which under the new lead and copper rules is the trigger level, the alert level for, uh, for further action being required. Um, we shared those results with the city of Duluth and I really wanna give some kudos to the city of Duluth because they've really stepped up in the last 24 months in terms of their engagement with this issue. They did their own testing program. They tested over hundred homes um, and compared to our tests, uh, their test results actually showed uh, twice as many homes uh, percentage wise with lead. So they're, they're, the problem actually that they unveiled was actually worse. Uh, and over half, almost half the homes in Duluth had lead levels exceeding 10 parts per billion, which is that uh, new federal trigger level. Uh, city of Duluth, for example, uh, has responded by ordering over a thousand uh, water filter pitchers uh, to distribute to homes with, uh, just to help them mit mitigate the issues. But we're very excited about the legislation coming down to, to move with this forward and to, because this is not, not something that we're gonna be able to fix with, lead, with water pitchers, it's gonna take a broad investment. Um, at this point, I just I want to turn the, uh, the the mic over to Helen Davis, who is very involved in our water testing program, um, 
including recruiting a team of teenagers to test in those central hillside neighborhoods. She also has her own uh, lead stories to share. So with that, uh, I'll, I will hand the mic over and thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the committee, Ms. Davis. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Hi, my name is Helen Davis and um, I'm a resident here in Duluth, Minnesota. I also am a mother of three children. I had some students here in Duluth, Minnesota from Dinfield High School to go out to door to door. I've been working with um, Mr. Anderson, um, got a group of kids to go and do door to door. And then they found out they have labels in their houses at home. We also went back and gave them pictures and, and um, make sure they're more safe now to drink out water. But as a mother, I have a son that was born in 84. He came up with lead in 86. Uh, I was on a WIC program and they found out he had lead in his system and that lead had infected my son for many, many years. He's 37 years old, he'll be 38 this year, and he still have that uh, lead in his system and it affects his brain. And I'm very, uh, very um, uh, concerned about lead for other children and other people that live here in the community and the world. That's my testimony. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Davis. Uh, next on the list is Gretchen Starks, and after Ms. Starks will be Paul Gardner. So welcome to the committee, Ms. Starks. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Okay, thank you uh, to the chair and the committee. My name is Gretchen Starks Martin. I'm testifying as a personal testimony and as a resident and as a voter in Sherburne County. I also volunteered a nearby National Wildlife Refuge to clean up debris and help plan educational programs. I have a very strong commitment to keeping our environment healthy for nature and the outdoors. This includes not using lead shot, which can be ingested by carrion eaters such as eagles, fox, coyotes, and humans as well through meals of wildfowl, wildfowl and deer. Lead ammo for rifles, shotguns, muzzle loaders for deer, waterfowl, and upland game is a problem. It needs a solution, and hopefully you can be part of that solution. Currently, my family lives adjacent to the Sherburne National Wildlife Refuge. This federal refuge requires waterfowl hunters to use non-toxic shot, a change that occurred under the administration of President George H.W. Bush, who is himself a hunter. I read that Three Rivers Park District also restricts lead for hunting on their lands in the metro. Since lead has been proven to be so toxic, I see no reason at all why it should not be banned on state wildlife management areas, other properties overseen by the DNR, and even throughout the state. My husband is a hunter, an avid hunter, and we eat venison, pheasant, turkey, and fish, mostly walleye. He uses non-toxic ammo to protect our health. However, some of our neighbors have said that lead ammo and lead leaders for fishing is cheaper and perform better, but this is no longer true. I want the committee to, to realize that. Adequate substitutes have been developed that maintain and in some cases improve performance while not increasing expense. So that is no longer an excuse. I need to reiterate, there are no safe levels of lead and I entreat the Minnesota legislature to provide healthy and ethical solutions. Use common sense for the protection of wildlife, of your own family and everyone else's family in this state. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Ms. Starks-Martin. Next is Paul Gardner and after Mr. Gardner is Gretchen Strati. Um, welcome to the committee, Mr. Gardner. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Paul Gardner, and I'm the administrator of the Clean Water Council. The Clean Water Legacy Act in 2006 created the State Advisory Council comprised of 28 members. The 17 voting members are citizens appointed by the governor, and we are also joined by six state agencies, the University of Minnesota, and four legislators, including Representative Heinzman of this committee. Uh, we are also glad to have Representative Acom on the committee in uh, 2019 and 2020. After the... After the after this, after, after uh, the situation in, excuse me. Yeah, she's been muted. Okay. Oh, thank you. Please continue, Mr. Gardner. Sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, after the situation in Flint, Michigan, and its 2016 biennial recommendations, the Clean Water Council requested 
that the Minnesota Department of Health determine the scope of the lead problem in drinking water and the cost to remove all lead in drinking water systems. Since there's no safe level of lead, the council at that time asked for this to be a high priority for the state. The legislature responded with a $300,000 appropriation in the fiscal 1819 legacy finance bill. In February 2019, the Department of Health, in conjunction with the University of Minnesota, responded with a first of its kind analysis. It evaluated costs and benefits to remove all lead from drinking water throughout the entire state. Uh, the cost was estimated to be two to four billion dollars, and the benefit four to eight billion dollars. In short, a minimum of two dollars in benefits to Minnesota for every dollar invested in removing lead. The next step beyond the report is to complete a lead service line inventory for the state. While the age of housing might be a good indicator of the presence of lead, it is not always certain. The new lead and copper rule updated by the US EPA also requires the inventory be completed by October of 2024. The governor's supplemental budget recommendations include a request for $4.029 million in fiscal 22-23 uh, for this inventory. Thank you for your attention, Mr. Chair and members, um, and we appreciate your focus on this issue. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Gardner. Uh, next up is Gretchen Strati, and then after Ms. Strati will be Dr. Zeke McKinney. Uh, welcome to the committee, Ms. Strati. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Gretchen Strati. I'm a resident of Robbinsdale, and I'm also the coordinator of the Wildlife Rescue Team with Wildlife Rehabilitation and Release. Um, our rescue team provides service, rescue services for injured and sick wildlife that the public's unable to safely capture on their own, and then we coordinate placement into the appropriate medical and rehabilitative care. I just wanted to briefly share our experiences with lead toxicity in wildlife. Uh, so our team has rescued uh, multiple animals from various areas throughout the state that were later diagnosed with lead poisoning. Um, for us, it's been primarily trumpeter swans and Canada geese. Last month, we, res we rescued two trumpeter swans from a frozen over lake in Annandale that were taken to the Wildlife Rehab Center in Roseville and were diagnosed with lead poisoning. Um, despite receiving treatment, um, both swans did have to be humanely euthanized after their conditions continued to deteriorate. Uh, last winter, our team rescued two trumpeter swans from Sucker Lake in Vandas Heights. Um, they were diagnosed with lead poisoning as well, and subsequent testing of over a dozen dead swans recovered from Sucker Lake identified lead poisoning as a cause of death, and that was attributed primarily to lead fishing sinkers. Um, lead poisoning has been identified as a primary cause of mortality for some of our wildlife species. Uh, the DNR identifies lead poisoning um, as the greatest threat to trumpeter swans in Minnesota and estimates that 40% of uh, trumpeter swan fatalities are caused by lead poisoning. Um, the DNR also states that um, lead poisoning from fishing sinkers and jigs may account for up to 50% of loon fatalities in loon breeding areas. Um, it also affects our mammal species. The Wildlife Rehab Center in Roseville started testing their admitted mammals and found that a third of their squirrels and 80% of their opossums had uh, lead levels in their systems. Uh, lead ammunition and sinkers are a significant threat to the health and well-being of our wildlife species, and much of this suffering and death is unnecessary and preventable since there are non-toxic alternatives that are readily available. Um, so I strongly support a ban on the use of lead ammunition and fishing tackle, and I believe this is a necessary action to protect our wildlife and our ecosystems. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Strati. Uh, next up is Dr. Zeke McKinney, and after Dr. McKinney will be Nicole Neeser. Uh, welcome to the committee, Dr. McKinney. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Hello, thank you, uh, Chair and members of this committee. My name is Dr. Zeke McKinney. I'm a physician at Health Partners in Occupational Environmental Medicine, as well as a faculty in the University of Minnesota School of Public Health and a researcher at Health Partners Institute. I'm currently the president of Twin Cities Medical Society, a resident of Minneapolis, and I have a clinical practice focused on environmental toxicology. Uh, so to reiterate what our many speakers already have said, uh, there is no safe lead, level of lead for anybody, adults or children, but children and pregnant women, of course, their fetuses are the most at risk. We see this in our clinic and practice with uh, impacts on the nervous system and the brain, uh, including slowed development uh, and slowed growth, learning behavior problems, hearing and speech problems, which ultimately lead to a lower IQ, decreased ability to pay attention in school, underperformance in school, and ultimately there's been many studies showing uh, increase in violent crime later in life. Other medical issues include anemia, high blood pressure, kidney problems, uh, reproductive problems, GI tract problems such as chronic constipation and chronic pain, uh, problems with bone density. Uh, the CDC actually updated its lead reference level for children and lowered it uh, in October 2021 because there continue to be peer-reviewed published articles about the long-term impacts of lead exposure even to this very day. So really lead exposure uh, exerts a downward pull no matter who you are. 
The problem is that, you know, this exposure is non-reversible and ultimately it's preventable. There are many sources, as we've, as you've heard here in these testimonies, uh, lead-based paint, soil contaminated from historical industrial exposures, lead service lines, plumbing. We saw problems uh, involved in Flint, Michigan with this. Uh, children also can be exposed through contaminated food and uh, candy, you know, folk remedies, uh, you know, workers, uh, their parents bringing home lead, such as we saw at Water Gremlin 2019. These are issues of equity. You know, lead exposure affects everyone, but not everyone's equally impacted. And ultimately, a lot of people don't even know they're being exposed. And because these groups are affected uh, in so many other ways, this is yet another mutually reinforcing factor affecting people's development. So in this regard, I uh, support a ban on lead tackle and lead ammunition. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Dr. McKinney. Uh, next up is Nicole Neeser. Uh, welcome to the committee and please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members. My name is Dr. Nicole Neeser. I am the Director of Dairy and Meat Inspection Division at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Uh, our division administers the Minnesota Hunter, Hunter Harvested uh, Venison Donation Program through which hunters can donate deer that they harvest during the various different hunting seasons uh, to food shelves. Uh, we've uh, managed this program since uh, 2008, and uh, in 2008, our first year, uh, the imp we received some information about possible lead uh, in donated venison, um, and it was brought to our attention as a potential food safety issue. Uh, we conducted further investigation using x-ray technology and laboratory testing um, to determine that uh, there was a significant amount of lead in the venison products that were handled and processed through the program. After consultation with the Minnesota Department of Health um, on the health and safety concerns, as well as the lead levels that we were seeing in the products that year, uh, we performed a full recall of all the products donated that year and uh, rescreened them for lead. Uh, since then, uh, our agency has performed x-ray screening of all the donated venison um, harvested by firearms in this program, and we use that to identify and remove packages that contain lead. lead. Uh, annual results show a relatively consistent trend of roughly 8 to 10 percent of product uh, screening positive for lead particles. Um, we throw packages that are identified with lead particles on x-ray um, away. Uh, in the 2021 season, which we conducted the screening uh, just last December, a little over 10 percent of the product was found to be contaminated with lead particles. Um, and we had to discard um, nearly 875 pounds of donated product uh, for that reason. Uh, this screening is also done in conjunction with education and outreach to processors on the best ways to prevent contamination. Um, these practices involve using smaller batches, using generous trimming of tissue around bullet tracks and processing into whole cuts uh, instead of ground products as ground products uh, have been more likely to um, contain lead um, this is likely due to uh, lead particles getting stuck in the grinder and further um, grinding those, part those particles into smaller pieces and further disp dispersing that through the product. Uh, Ms. Neeser, you are um, at time. If you could just wrap up your statement, please. Uh, well, that was the end of my statement, so I guess that's a perfect, uh, perfect ending. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Appreciate your testimony. I also have a Mary Benrood who signed up to testify, but I don't see her. I'll give a few seconds just to make sure. Okay, um, so I'll just assume she is not here. So with that, uh, that concludes the, the list of people who signed up to testify. Um, and so with that, we'll turn to member questions. I have Representatives Heinzman, Grunhagen, and Acom on the list. So Representative Heinzman, you are up first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When our public facilities authority representative spoke today uh, and described uh, a little of what uh, was going on in their financing and the respective dollars that could be available, uh, I was hoping to get a better description of the infrastructure that we're attempting to uh, target and a little better idea where that's used and why lead has become a problem. And I'm not totally clear, are we talking about a pure lead pipe? Or are we talking about fittings? Or are we talking about coatings? It'd be nice to have a, a, a better idea of what that is. Thank you, Representative Heinzman. Um, Mr. Freeman, I think this question is directed at you. Um, so please, uh, please respond. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Heinzman. I, and I'm not the best person to give a, a real detailed answer to that question, but as I understand it in general, uh, for the most part, we are talking about um, lead pipes that provide the, the service connection from the, the city water main and the street to each house. Um, there probably are situations where there's, um, it, it's not necessarily the pipe, but there are fittings or, or other uh, things within that service line. And essentially the, the goal here would be to remove all of the lead components. Representative Heinzman, did you have a follow-up? Um. I'm, I'm not hearing you if you do, so uh, I can come back to you if you Sorry, if you Mr. Do. Chair, oh, I was having a problem with, the, with uh, my phone. So no problem. Uh, it sounds like there's uh, some missing information there. And if there could be some follow up with the committee and its members, that would be great. I'd love to know exactly what the uh, equipment or supply line problems are. And uh, it's always better to have some, some more data there and what's being done or has been done to prevent these kinds of scenarios from playing out. I have lead line tanks uh, in infrastructure in our water treatment systems here in the lakes area and the paint is the culprit in that case. It would just be nice to have some, some more technical information. Okay, uh, sure, Representative Heinzman. Uh, Mr. Freeman, if you are able to produce some additional information, if you could uh, share it with our committee administrator, he could make sure to uh, share it in turn with all of the members, including Representative Heinzman. Looks like you, uh, did you have a response? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll, be, I'll contact the health department. They'll be the ones to provide that more detailed information. Okay, sure, that would be fine, thank you. Uh, next on the list, I have Representative Grunhagen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks for the testimony. Um, I uh, I have a question for the individual from the PUC that just spoke also on the uh, on replacing the lead pipes. Okay, we're getting forty three million dollars per year for five years, the way I understood it. So uh, that'll be approximately two hundred million dollars from the federal government. What will be the total cost of the necessary replacement that we have in the state? So is it quite a bit more than that? Would we subsidize that with state dollars? Or uh, if you want to respond to that question, I have one more question after that. Sure. Um, I think this is for Mr. Freeman. Uh, Mr. Freeman? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, Representative Grunhagen. Um, the, again, I'm going to have to refer to the health department. Um, they do have more information on the the scope of the, the problem to, to removing all of these lead service lines. I, I, I don't have those numbers and I'm not sure anybody has the final number on that. It certainly is um, no doubt larger than the $200 million that we expect to get from the federal government. Uh, thank you, Mr. Freeman, Representative Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for that response, Mr. Freeman. Uh, I guess I'd like to, uh, from the author of the bill maybe to find out what the total cost will be going forwards and how much, where the sources of money will be coming from in order to cover the forward cost. My understanding is from talking to the staff, it's gonna be quite substantially higher than uh, the 200 million over that period of time. And I agree that definitely needs to have something done. Uh, the other, the, you know, the testimony kind of mixed between the two bills. And uh, my next question is about ammunition. I have a letter here, which you provided in opposition to this bill, strong opposition. It's from the National Shooting Sports Foundation. And they express strong opposition. Now they're a trade association of firearms, ammunition, hunting, and recreational shooting. They have over 12,000 manufacturers, distributors, fire, firearm retailers, shooting ranges, and sportsmen organizations, et cetera. They go on to say, despite there being no scientific evidence to support the hypothesis that lead ammunition is endangering the health of individuals or wildlife, anti-hunting interest groups are continuing to press state legislatures and departments around the country to support a ban on traditional ammunition. 
which they go on to point out it's going to cost more and it's uh you're going to get more wounded animals out of that because lead i'm not sure about copper but uh i'd have to research that but the information i've received is lead has a much better punching power in terms of bringing uh animal down than uh than what uh, steel does. And the result is you're gonna get a lot more wounded animals out of this. So why do we, you know, why does an organization this size make these types of statements about, uh, about lead and shooting in, in contradiction to the testimony we've heard about this? I, you know, I mean, to me, how can we have 12,000 people supporting or 12,000 individuals and organizations supporting uh, the use of lead. And again, it's banned in federal wildlife areas or uh, uh, water life areas already. Um, so if somebody who is concerned about it wants to respond, why this organization would come out with this, with this letter, I would certainly appreciate it. Uh, sure. Just to just to specify, you know, I, 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 the testifiers were just providing some general information on these two topics. We will be hearing from the two bill authors subsequently. Um, I did see Mr. Henderson raise his hand uh, to respond to this question. So, uh, if you can respond, Mr. Mr. Henderson, briefly, I think that would uh, be helpful. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Rep Representative Gunhagen. Uh, it seems that some of the uh, reasons or excuses that are being presented right now uh, by them are <laughs> frankly about 10 years out of date. The effectiveness of copper ammunition has been consistently shown to be very effective. The uh, effectiveness, the accuracy, and, uh, and cost actually are very comparable with uh, lead or in many cases even better. And people find that uh, once they have tried copper ammunition, for example, they never go back to lead. They're very happy with this. And the other factor is that changing to non-toxic ammunition has nothing to do with anti-hunting. If people are using copper or non-toxic ammunition, they're still hunting, they're coming home with game, they're enjoying the outdoors, and they're not poisoning other wildlife. And it's I fail to understand why Hunters who are existing to keep, can keep using lead don't care about the other kinds of wildlife that are being poisoned. I think that it's important that hunters ex, uh, show a concern for all wildlife in their activity and also that uh, with the effectiveness, effectiveness that's been demonstrated by copper and non toxic ammunition, it is more effective and the hunters who try it are very happy with it. So uh, the, the industry. Uh, has nothing to do, or uh, changing to non-toxic am ammunition has nothing to do with anti-hunting or taking away the Second Amendment or taking away your guns. It's simply a different kind of ammunition that in many cases is even more effective than ever. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Uh, Representative Grunhagen, any uh, brief follow-up? Then I do want to get to a couple other members, and I would like to get to the bills as well, which discuss okay. this topic specifically. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that response. And I, the only uh, difference I would have is that um, I don't see uh, organizations like this. And by the way, the letter was dated February 2nd, 2022, so it's very recent. Um, I don't see organizations or hunters not caring about what happens uh, to people or uh, wildlife or whatever. Uh, but when they have an organization of this size, that promotes this type of opposition to this bill. I think it's confusing to a lot of people, hunters and uh, uh, people involved in the uh, in the uh, hunting and uh, recreational shooting area. And uh, I I wish somehow there should, could be some peace in the valley on this. I will admit I have not researched copper. Uh, bullets, and I do need to do some work on that. Most of the research I've looked at is with steel, which uh, has a number of problems compared to lead. Anyway, appreciate that response, and thanks for the opportunity. Yep, thank uh, you Mr. for the chairman. Representative Heisman here is NSF 
NSSF here, could they address this issue as well? I, it seems as though they're being referenced. Uh, Representative, they, yeah, Representative Heisman, I'd like to get, I'd like to get to the other two members. Then I was planning on calling on you as well, Mr. Um, Chairman. I, I'm, I'm wondering, were they also here to testify? Were they not on the schedule to also testify? I believe they are testifying on the the bill. Um, uh, so I do have them on the list uh, at that point. And uh, my aim is to uh, get to the uh, lead service line bill at 11:30 and the uh, non-toxic ammunition bill at 11:45. Mr. So. Chairman, it would seem if they had something to offer specific to Mr. Grinhagen, Representative Grinhagen's question, that would be helpful if that was offered at this time, since they were specifically referenced. Um, okay. Well, I will uh, let's. I will go turn to Representative Acom and then Representative Pryor since they were next on the list. And then, if there is time before eleven thirty, I will give them an opportunity Mr. to. Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, the question was just offered moments ago. You're going to separate that for no apparent reason. It would be nice to get their feedback since they were referenced. Okay. Thank you for your suggestion, Representative Heinzman. Representative Acom. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of our speakers today. Um, I appreciate the conversation, and I wanted to ask Mr. Freeman from the Public Facilities Authority a little bit more about the um, federal infrastructure funding. And, um, and, and I really appreciate also that the Department of Health put in the chat some information regarding the situation here in Minnesota. Um, and I wondered if with the federal infrastructure money, is there with both the grants and the revolving loans, is that, are there matching funds that will be um, required for that um, to be um, used here in Minnesota? Mr. Freeman. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Acom, um, the, the lead service line money does not require a state match. There are other parts of the water infrastructure funding through the, the federal bill that, that does require a state match is, and is part of our um, bonding request in the governor's recommendations, but lead service line, no, no match required. Thanks, that's helpful. And then Mr. Chair, if I may have one quick question for um, Mr. Gardner, and it's revolved, it, it's around kind of the scope of the lead issue, um, lead service line issue, and the work that the Clean Water Council has been doing around this inventory. And you talked a little bit about some different years and appropriations and funding, and just wondering if what has been currently um, appropriated or um, allocated is enough to give us a an inventory of lead service lines throughout the state. Uh, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Gardner. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gardner. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Acom, uh, of course, I would always uh, defer on uh, details to the PFA and, and the health department, but uh, the um, I had the same question, um, just as a generalist. Uh, the idea behind an inventory is having a more accurate idea of just where the lead pipes are. Um, I, as a, someone who's owned a house here for 25 years, that was built in 1971, every year I find a new surprise left by the builder or a previous owner. So I, I, there aren't really uh, records indicating which has lead. You can kind of guess based on the vintage of the house. And it depends on the city. Sometimes there's an ordinance. Uh, but there are also things like lead solder, which I think was allowed uh, nationally until 1986. It can be on the inside of the house. Uh, there are these, um, I forget what you call it, like a snarkle joint that can appear on the inside. So um, when it comes to the public service line uh, inventory, I don't think that's going to be terribly difficult, but it is required now uh, by October of uh, 2024. Uh, by the EPA through the lead and copper rule. Uh, so we'll have a better idea. Uh, St. Paul actually has a digital tool where you can look at your house to see what the likelihood is that you have lead in it. Sometimes it's confirmed, sometimes there's a question mark. But this happens all over the state. It's in uh, greater Minnesota, it's in the metro. Uh, whenever you have a house that's old enough, there could be a possibility for lead. Okay, thank so you. Whatever. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Gardner. Uh, Representative Pryor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. and. Just uh, maybe this is something that we could talk about uh, again um, when the bill author introduces it. But I was interested in Dr. Neeser's testimony about the eight to ten percent of the donated um, deer um, that were that was harvested um, shows up as having um, contamination from lead. And then you know I'm trying to also understand what that means in our general population. 
if people are using lead ammunition, if they're not properly um, removing that lead, um, are we also assuming that people are actually um, then consuming it unknowingly that, that they are actually endangering their health um, by consuming lead from their ammunition? And I, I don't know if um, Dr. Nisar has any more comment to help me understand how this may be happening in general beyond um, what's been donated. Uh, Dr. Nisar. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair and Representative. Um, I will just say that, you know, we, uh, we collect the venison and scan it and, you know, we have a good uh, amount of information about the, the prevalence of lead in the products that we were, that we scan as part of the donation program. Um, we haven't done the same research in terms of other deer uh, processed at processing plants, so we, we don't have, you know, sort of that that link to say it's exactly the same in in that um, in those products that people generally consume, but we don't have a reason to believe that would it would be any different. And in fact, I think our processors uh, pay particular attention to the lead issue um, in donated products because we spend a lot of time talking to them about implementing good practices. And so I think there's good reason to to make the connection that 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 amount of lead is probably present in a lot of the um, venison that is um, harvested and consumed. And um, one of the reasons for that is that lead spreads in those carcasses much more than people think. Um, I think somewhat, one, of the one of the testifiers showed a picture of an x-ray and um, that is definitely representative of what we see in terms of from the meat processing uh, plant is those bullets uh, shatter uh, quite extensively, a lot of research has been, uh, some research has been done to show, you know, 18 to 24 inches from a wound. And so, um, and the particles are small, so they're hard to see. Um, so I'm not sure if that helps answer your question, but just to give a little bit more information on what we do and, and uh, why we think that it continues to be an issue. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nieser, um, and thank you, Representative Pryor. We do still have a few minutes before uh, 11.30. Representative Heinzman, would you like to hear from, uh, I think it's Mr. Cole. Um, would you like to hear from him before we turn to the bills? I certainly would like to get some uh, answers. I thought that uh, Representative Bernhagen's points were, were very uh, uh, important to have some more clarification on. And if the representative from the NSF could speak to that, I'd appreciate the testimony. Sure. Um, why don't I just say, you can, uh, Mr. Cole, you can have two minutes similar to what our testifiers had. So um, if, you, if you need that much. So uh, go ahead, uh, please identify yourself though for the record and proceed with your response. So first of all, thank you very much for your time. I'm Nephi Cole, I'm the Director of Government Relations and State Affairs uh, for the National Student Sports Foundation. I'm gonna have to apologize first and ask, did you guys, did you want me to speak to the testimony I had for coming up or just answer, if it's on the question that was asked previously, I'll have to apologize, but there's been a considerable amount of discussion going on prior to us being involved in it. And so it's made it very difficult to follow from a, to, to provide that response that you're seeking. So can I ask you, if you have a specific question that I, can you provide that to me again so I can adequately respond to it? Representative Heinzman, yeah, would yeah, you like to I clarify? Certainly, I certainly could. The information that Representative Grunhagen brought, is there any timeline on that that could be relevant? I mean, we heard from Mr. Henderson, I think that uh, there was a discrepancy in the age of the data. Mr. Cole. Oh, I'm sorry. So, I'm sorry. Had you completed? Had you finished, Representative Heinzman, or did your audio cut out again? So, I'm just going to quickly share. There's a considerable amount of data out there on wildlife impacts and human health. Um, I'm prepared to testify later uh, to talking about kind of the scope of that uh, in, in terms of ammunition. Um, I would briefly say, I think the data is, is very well compiled in that area. Um, again, prepared to talk to it. On the human health side, I think you guys deserve kudos for the work that you're doing addressing the causes of uh, blood lead levels in children and adults in the United States of America. You've noted them. Ammunition isn't one of them, and I'm prepared to talk more about that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Cole. Thank you. I yep, thank you, thank Representative Heinz. Thank you, Mr. Heinz. Chairman. I appreciate the time that you were able to address that. Yep, uh, no problem. So I think with that, um, I will turn to the bills. I know Representative Jordan is not a member of this committee and has been waiting patiently, so we'll take her bill first. 
Um, as I said, these are informational hearings. Um, and uh, so we, we won't be taking amendments or anything like that. But <clears throat> excuse me, we should have some time for questions, though. Uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Jordan. Would you like to uh, describe your bill? It's House File 2650. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And it appears there has been some discussion already, but um, thank you again, Mr. Chair, and good morning, members of the committee. I am excited to present House File 2650, which is a bill to pre protect Minnesotans from exposure to lead in their drinking water through lead service lines. Members, this is fundamentally a bill to protect Minnesotans from exposure to lead. And I'll echo what you've heard many times today that no amount of exposure to lead is safe. Lead service lines are also one of the largest lead sources in Minnesota drinking water. And often lead service lines are both publicly and privately owned. We must replace both parts simultaneously to avoid increasing lead concentration in drinking water. House File 2650 creates a grant program to fund the removal of all lead service lines in Minnesota. Cities may use these grants to identify and map their existing lead lines, remove and replace lead lines, and maximize federal funding for lead line replacement. Priority is given to, pro to removal projects in census tracts with concentrated poverty or located in designated opportunity zones. Priority is also given to projects submitted by business owners of color and female business owners. Projects must also commit to employing contractors that pay employees at the prevailing wage rate. Furthermore, cities can also use these grants to maximize federal funding for their projects. I am still working on this bill to maximize that federal funding level and to ensure this bill meets the needs of Minnesota cities, townships, workers, and water drinkers from War Road to Winona. The EPA is still working on guidelines for distributing this infrastructure money related to lead service lines, and this bill will evolve as we have more information. I'm sure none of us want to leave federal funding on the table to improve the health and well-being of our constituents. I'm currently working with the Minnesota Department of Health, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, a number of other cities across the state, union members, and clean water advocates, and would welcome all of your help as well. Above all, House File 2650 seeks to minimize Minnesota's exposure to lead in our drinking water. Not only will this bill improve our quality of life, but a report by the Minnesota Department of Health and the University of Minnesota in 2019 found that for every dollar spent on addressing lead in our drinking water, we would see at least $2 return in benefits from better health outcomes. That same report is where the $300 million estimate has come from, but as I stated earlier, we are still awaiting guidance on the final cost. I will make sure that members of this committee receive this report, and it also appears that Mr. Gardner has linked to it in the Zoom chat as well. Remember members, no amount of exposure to lead is safe, and this bill addresses the most common source of lead contact in Minnesota. Thank you for prioritizing lead removal this morning, and I would like to turn it over to um, any testimony that has not already happened from community members in support of this bill for the health of all Minnesotans. I know, I believe Mr. Thorson from my unit is here and has not spoken yet. Yes, uh, he is the one testifier we have on this bill specifically. So uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Thorson. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is John Thorson. I'm Legislative Director for Layuna, Minnesota, and North Dakota. Uh, we're Minnesota's infrastructure union, representing more than 12,000 skilled construction laborers that build and maintain our roads, highways, uh, bridges, and basic utilities that allow our communities to thrive. Um, in investments in the 2020 Local Jobs and Projects Bill, uh, the new federal funding from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, together are bold opening move and a critical down payment for addressing Minnesota's estimated $11.5 billion need for water infrastructure improvements throughout the state. A robust approach by this legislature can be a truly transformational investment in our state's future and put us on a path for removing the estimated 100,000 uh, lead lines that threaten our drinking water. Uh, we strongly support the provisions of House File 2650 that would create a program for eliminating all lead service lines in the state by 2032 and provided direct grant funding necessary to ensure that cities can map, identify, and replace both the public and private portions of lead service lines. Uh, Lyuna uh, members are skilled in lead service replacement. Uh, we take pride in working to help our communities uh, address drinking water needs and have worked on lead pipe replacements in many communities throughout our region. Uh, we collaborate with cities to leverage our expertise and union training centers to accelerate the identification and elimination of these dangerous lead pipes in our communities. And our registered apprenticeship programs uh, support critical efforts to increase participation of uh, women, people of color, veterans, and other underrepresented groups uh, in the workforce throughout our state. 
Um, we encourage your support of a multi-path effort for making critical state investments, which will ensure that lead lines are replaced and clean drinking water is delivered to families and children across Minnesota to increase the health, social and economic vitality of our state. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Thorson. Um, that is all the testimony, testimony we have for this bill specifically. Is, are there any um, questions or discussion uh, comments from members? Uh, Representative Bierman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, make a comment regarding uh, being a member of Health and Human Services. Uh, the last three years, I've been we've been hearing about these dangers of lead in uh, the environment um, and dangers of you know, this type of thing, whether it's lead paint or in the pipes or in ammunition. Lead in the environment is not healthy for humans. And uh, we just need to realize that the costs to all of us, whether we're the infected party or not, are great. I, I re remember hearing that cost of treating someone with lead poisoning is approximately, you can calculate it at about a million dollars over their lifetime. So um, just a question, uh, thank you for um, Representative Jordan for bringing the bill forward. And could you just uh, tell me again, what level of lead is safe for humans to ingest? Representative Jordan. Mr. Chair, Representative Beerman, members of the committee, no amount of exposure to lead is safe for humans. Thank you. Representative Heinzman, I saw your hand go up and down a couple of times. Did you have a question related to this bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that I'll wait. Okay, sure. Uh, any further member discussion on this bill? Okay, seeing none, thank you again, Representative Jordan. Appreciate your, uh, your patience uh, and your presentation of the bill. So next, uh, we have a bill from a committee member, uh, Representative Morrison, just to give you a sense here. Um, so we do have a little over 20 minutes left. We have two testifiers in support of the bill. We have two testifiers who signed up for public testimony. Um, and so I'd like to get through the bill, discuss, bill presentation as well as the testimony, and then hopefully we will have, we should have some, uh, and I'll, I'll stick to the two minutes, I think, for testifiers, just um, be, so we have some time left for a member discussion as well. Um, so uh, again, uh, Representative Morrison, would you like to describe your bill, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair, yes. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, thank you for the opportunity to present House File 2556, a bill that would move Minnesota away from the use of lead ammunition and by banning its use for hunting with firearms. The bill would help ease that transition by requiring the Department of Natural Resources to create a voucher program whereby hunters could receive non-toxic ammunition at no or reduced cost. It also asked DNR to establish a lead ammunition buyback program and provide opportunities for hunters to exchange lead ammunition with non-toxic ammunition. We've heard testimony today about the negative effects of lead in the environment and to human health. And I want to thank and appreciate the scientists and doctors, conservationists, and environmental stewards who took the time to be here today to share their expertise. I think it can't be said today enough. There is no known safe level of lead. The Centers for Disease Control has lowered the blood level level of concern in children from 60 micrograms per deciliter to 25 to 10 to five with consideration to lower it further as more information and more knowledge has been gained. There is no known safe level. Exposure in childhood to even slightly elevated levels of lead produces lasting neurological deficits in intelligence and behavior. Lead is a known neurotoxin. We've actually known that lead is a deadly toxin for thousands of years. It's one of the most well-studied toxins and there's overwhelming scientific evidence and consensus that it's toxic to the central and peripheral nervous, renal, cardiovascular, reproductive, immune, and hematologic systems in humans and animals. As we gain knowledge about the effects of lead, we responded by gradually removing lead from gasoline in the 70s and from paint in the late 70s, and eventually, as we're talking about this morning, from lead pipes. The impacts of lead ammunition on wildlife have also been known. And in 1991, former President George H.W. Bush banned the use of lead shot on waterfowl after it was shown to be sickening migratory wetland bird populations. Lead-based ammunition is a significant, relatively unregulated source of lead knowingly discharged into the environment in the United States. 
This poses significant health risks to humans and wildlife. Evidence shows that the discharge of lead ammunition increases environmental lead levels, especially in areas of concentrated shooting activity. And lead doesn't degrade, it accumulates in the environment and creates long-term cumulative toxic pollution. The discharge of lead-based ammunition, ammunition also poses risks of elevated lead exposure to gun users. And lead-based bullets used to shoot wildlife can fragment into hundreds of small pieces, many small enough to be easily ingested by scavenging animals or incorporated into processed meat for human consumption. Lead-contaminated venison is concerning for everyone, but especially pregnant women, young children, and adults with hypertension. It does bear repeating. There is no safe known level of lead. Alternatives to lead ammunition have been developed and are manufactured by all major am ammunition companies. The quality and accuracy, as Carol Henderson pointed out, of non-toxic al alternatives are now equal to or exceed the performance of lead ammunition. Let's agree that it's time to move on from lead ammunition and hunting for the safety and health of ourselves, our children, and the land and wildlife that we love. Let's work together to determine the best way to make that transition. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Morrison. I have two testifiers um, as part of the real presentation, Kelly Straka and then Kathleen Schuler. So uh, welcome to the committee, uh, Kelly Straka. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair, Chair Freiberg. Can you hear me OK? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chair Freiberg and members of committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. This is an impressive committee on obviously an important topic, and I'm very happy to be here. My name is Dr. Kelly Straka, and I am the recently hired Wildlife Section Manager for the Minnesota DNR. As you may be aware, DNR has, throughout time, supported and conducted studies to improve our understanding of lead-related issues, such as bullet fragmentation, lead deposition in the environment, exposure risks to a variety of wildlife species, and Hunter's willingness to adopt non-toxic alternatives. However, our efforts have not been limited to research. In 2016, the DNR proposed a requirement to use non-toxic shot on wildlife management areas in the state's farmland zone. As proposed, this requirement would have eliminated the use of lead shot on over 400,000 acres of wildlife managed lands. Outside of Minnesota's borders and in conjunction with 12 other states in the Midwest and three Canadian provinces, we can't forget them. Leadership of the Minnesota DNR voted to become a supporting partner in the North American Non-Lead Hunting Partnership. This organization, formed in 2017 by the Oregon Zoo, the Peregrine Fund, and the Institute for Wildlife Studies, seeks to expand the coalition of hunters, anglers, and other conservationists dedicated to improving ecosystem and wildlife health by choosing non-lead options. As a licensed wildlife veterinarian myself, and the former chair of the Midwest Fish and Wildlife Health Committee. I am proud of this commitment by our state wildlife agencies to address lead in the environment. Ultimately, the DNR does support the intent of House File 2556. Leadership in our organization has met with Representative Morrison, and we look forward to continuing to work on this bill. It won't be without challenges, as we've heard today, as product availability and cost have often been cited as barriers to non-toxic shot implementation. However, we do feel there is room to engage with our many partners to make this and other related legislative efforts work to protect the health of all Minnesotans, human and non-human alike. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Straka. Next, uh, I have Kathleen Schuler. Um, and after Ms. Schuler for the public testimony, uh, we will the first testifier will be Brian Gosh. So Ms. Schuler, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Kathleen Schuler. I am a retired public health professional, and I spent 17 years of my career working to reduce human exposure to toxic chemicals. I speak today in support of House File 2556 to eliminate lead in ammunition and to establish programs that assist gun users in transitioning to non-toxic ammunition. I will focus on the human health impacts of lead and draw on a 2013 consensus statement by 30 leading scientists with expertise in lead and environmental health. 
Um, I think we've heard everybody say that <laughs> lead is a potent brain toxin, but it also has many other health effects. Um, people with prolonged exposure to lead may be at risk for high blood pressure, heart disease, kidney disease, reduced fertility, and cancer. The discharge of lead-based ammunition is known to pose risks of elevated lead exposure to gun users. Uh, high blood levels of shooters at firing ranges were reported in several studies at levels known to co cause human health effects. So some of these shooters had uh, between 10 and 40 micrograms per deciliter of blood in their lead, and that affects your health. Uh, Lead-based bu bullets, we heard, can fragment into hundreds of pieces, small enough to be ingested by animals and humans. Lead-based ammunition is a significant source of lead exposure in humans that ingest wild game and hunters that consume meat shot with lead-based ammunition has been shown to have lead fragments in their gastrointestinal tract. And we heard about the uh, Department of Ag finding of, of lead in uh, donated venison. We must eliminate this preventable source of lead in our environment and toxic lead exposures that harm the health of wildlife gun users, and people who consume wild game. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in favor of this important bill. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Schuler. Uh, next is uh, Brian Gosh, and then the final uh, testifier who signed up will be Nephi Cole. So Mr. Gosh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Brian Gosh. I'm a lawyer and registered lobbyist with the National Rifle Association of America. Thank you for having me here today to get to express my opinion on House File 2556 uh, and speak in opposition to it. Uh, traditional ammunition is significantly cheaper than its alternatives and easier to find. Banning lead ammunition will make the supply chain problem of any type of ammunition much worse. Further, the alternatives to lead ammunition can be less lethal and therefore less ethical for hunting and generally are not better for the environment. A decrease in the purchase of traditional ammunition would adversely affect conservation funding. Hunters are the largest supporters of conservation through excise taxes levied on ammunition, firearms, and hunting equipment by the Pittman-Robertson Act of 1937, which generated more than 17 million in funding for Minnesota wildlife conservation in 2020 alone. The fines imposed by House File 2556 uh, seem excessive and punitive. The cost of the buyback program is also likely to be enormous and costly to the general fund. Logistics are not contained in the bill as far as how to deal with uh, ammo being stored, uh, where it will be stored, how it will be stored, uh, what will be done with the uh, ammunition that's collected. Uh, how will the public be informed of the, of the ban? And how much will be paid uh, to, for the cost of each type of ammo uh, turned in? Uh, so with that and for other reasons, uh, we would oppose House File 2556. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Gosh. Um, our final testifier, welcome back to the committee, um, is uh, Nephi Cole. Please, uh, I, just since we're on a new bill, uh, please identify yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Nephi Cole, Director of Government Relations and State Affairs at the National Shooting Sports Foundation. I'm also a Master in Environmental and Water Science and a Certified Wetland Delineator. I was a professional USDA biologist for 12 years and a conservation planner professionally. Um, the, your, some of your folks who have talked are absolutely right. There are 3 billion less birds in the United States of America. Uh, birds are in decline in this country. It's a great tragedy. There are some great things to, to say about that though. The re when you look at those numbers, there are two notable exceptions where the trend line is extremely positive. Those are raptors and waterfowl. And I think that's important when we're talking about this ammunition issue. Kudos for the work you're doing on removing lead from areas where it is a human health ingestion concern. Ammunition is, what, is not one of those areas. Bullets are not a concern in shooting ranges. Handling ammunition is not the concern. When you're looking at lead from shooters, you're looking at gaseous lead issues and poor ventilation. It has nothing to do with consumption. Following on that, blood lead levels in hunters, and this is verifiable in every study you're going to be able to find, blood lead levels in hunters are statistically indistinguishable from blood lead levels in non-hunters using, using the most practical mm -hmm. 
means of blood testing that are available to doctors. So you can find differences, but you have to go look for it. Um, in, in neither one of these cases, in none of these cases, do they approach levels of CDC concerns. And so you're not going to be able to tell the difference between a hunter and non-hunter, someone who consumes wild game with lead and someone who doesn't, using standard medical practices when you test blood le level lead. To be frank, lead is a red herring here. We do need to deal with lead in the environment, but ammunition, lead ammunition and consumption of lead ammunition does not represent a human health risk. Uh, that time, money, and effort should be spend, spent on taking lead out of pipes, uh, mm. removing lead dust, contaminated soils, and those areas that are a human health concern. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, so we'll turn to member discussion. Um, I have Representatives Grunhagen, Pryor, and Heinzman on the list. Representative Grunhagen. Oops. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm finding this to be a very interesting discussion, <laughs> considering it's an information only. But uh, is Miss uh, Stryker there yet, or Strucker? She uh, Miss Straka, um, I Straka. yes, it looks like she is still here. If I so, could ask her. Sure, she just uh, turned her camera on. So Representative Grunhagen, please proceed with oh. your question. How many states have passed laws like like uh, uh, this uh, where they ban the use of lead? Our surrounding states and across the nation, do you know right offhand? You kind of referenced an uh, organization in our area about it, but I was just wondering specifically how many states have actually done that. Ms. Straka. Mr. Chair and Representative, thank you for the question. I do not unfortunately know offhand how many um, have, have moved forward with a full ban on lead, whether that be on just public lands or within the entire state. I can definitely look, uh, look into that information for you and get it. What I can say is um, I've recently come to Minnesota DNR from Michigan. And in the Michigan DNR, this is a, a very important topic right now. And in fact, we formed a, a team to look at developing a policy for um, a transition to non-toxic alternatives. And so they are looking at that actively in the Michigan DNR right now. So again, to follow up on your specific question, I'll make sure we can get as much information as we can for you. Um, and I'm happy to do the same with any, any other questions related to this. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Straka. Please, uh, if you are able to get that information, please share it with our committee staff and I'll make sure it gets shared with all committee members. Uh, Representative okay. Grunhagen. Oh, one more quick question. Is uh, the last testifier, I just uh, forgot to write his name down. Uh, Mr. Uh, Cole who, is here. He looks very eager to respond as well. So please <laughs> proceed with your question. So Mr. Cole, based on your testimony, I find that, do you believe this is an attack on ammunition availability uh, as far as the uh, lead in bullets and uh, that really the other sources are the primary is what I picked up from your testimony. Uh, Mr. Cole. So first I would have to say, I don't think that this is some kind of a coordinated attack to take ammunition away from people. I think that the folks who have testified today, they're doing so in absolute, you know, best uh, with best of intentions. Um, I will say honestly, lead is not a population level impact that you're seeing affect wildlife populations. And they won't argue this. They're going to say individuals, yes, populations, no. And it's not affecting human health. In California, California is the only state that has passed a lead hunting ban for ammunition. That ban has been phased in since 2007. It's caused some significant supply chain issues in that state. In fact, a box of 30-06 ammunition, uh, federal um, I forget what their the brand their their specific box uh, badging is, but it's about 250 bucks for that box of 30 out six, and that's because you just can't meet demand. It's it's uh, it's a it's a supply and demand issue. It's problematic, and it does not. And even in California, where you've seen the ban, there's you can't find trend lines associated with water with waterfowl with wildlife populations where you've seen an impact of that ban positive or negative on populations of wildlife in California. You have seen a negative impact in the population of hunters. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Uh, Representative Grunhagen, we do have a hard stop at noon because of the okay. uh, remote nature here. I would like to get to Representative Pryor and Representative Heinzman. Yep. So did you have a follow-up? No, I'm done. Okay, thank you. Representative Pryor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I just wanted 
it's kind of in the tradition that uh, was established by uh, Vice Chair Bierman, um, we established that there is no known safe level of lead. But we also heard from um, Dr. McKinney earlier in this committee meeting that the effects of lead, and especially when we're talking about children and brain development, are irreversible. Um, so thank you, Mr. McKinney, for bringing that up. And, um, and I think that's relevant to the, the bill that we're talking about now, uh, especially if we're looking at successful hunters um, they, that have venison um, to share with their families and friends. Um, I think they need to know about these risks and uh, the best way to do it is uh, for us to uh, step forward and, and talk about concrete public health terms of what it means to have um, to be using lead um, to for hunting. Um, so, so two facts I think that we need to take away from this discussion about lead, no known safe levels, and also that the effects in children are irreversible. Thank you, Representative Pryor. Uh, Representative Heinzman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to actually ask the question. It seems as though we're making a few statements today, and uh, I'd like to use the time for questions for that. Uh, could Mr. Ghosh, if he has the information, it'd be helpful. Do we have any idea how much lead-based ammunition is used nationally versus uh, the alternatives? And I'm interested because we're hearing, of course, from many of uh, many folks in the shooting sports, that there would be difficulties with the supply chain. Uh, could you speak to that, Mr. Gosh? Uh, thank Gosh. you quickly. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sure. Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Representative Heinzman. Uh, approximately 90% of traditional ammunition used today is lead-based, and so as far as supply chains are concerned, um, I mean, obviously. Federal has a manufacturing plant in Minnesota, north of the cities, and uh, there's already a huge supply chain problem with over uh, 840 uh, million, uh, you know, um, uh, pieces of ammunition taken out of the supply chain uh, for, for 2020 with first-time gun owners. Uh, these are people who bought their, per their firearms for the very first time. Uh, probably due to some civil unrest issues across the country. Um, and if you assume each of those, you know, bought two boxes of ammunition with 50 rounds in each, um, you know, that's a lot out of the supply chain right there. And if you go to the stores, uh, you see in empty shelves, um, and it's hard to find ammunition now as it is. Thank you, Mr. Gosh. Representative Heinzman, quick follow up. We only have a minute yeah. or so left. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm hoping that uh, Representative Morrison could maybe address that in the legis in the bill that she's offering. I'm just wondering, has Representative Morrison uh, any strategies to try to deal with the potential impact of shortages? Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Heinzman. Uh, and you know, supply chain issues are impacting every industry across the globe right now due to the pandemic. Uh, so this is a challenge in many industries. Uh, I really appreciate the conversation this morning. I enjoyed meeting with Mr. Cole and talking about industry concerns and their perspective. And I would love for us to get to a place where we can agree that we want to get lead out of the environment and then move forward from there. I appreciate what it, that that's a challenge for the industry that has spent many decades being used to producing lead ammunition. Um, but as we learn things, we have to evolve and that includes industry. So no, knowing that there is no safe known level of lead, uh, let's protect our kids and our futures and our beautiful uh, wildlife and land here in Minnesota. And I, I think we should start here by starting to transition away from lead, lead ammunition. Thanks cool. for the opportunity and the conversation this morning. So what I'm hearing is that, there is that there are no uh, strategies to try to deal with a potential supply chain problem that might be created by this bill. The bill author has zero uh, knowledge on our strategy that would help to respond to this problem that could potentially be created by this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative Heinzman. Uh, Representative Morrison, would you like to uh, uh, conclude briefly and on the bill? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I sort of gave my concluding statement, but uh, thanks for the, the, the uh, comment, Representative Heinzman. I think that all industries are struggling with supply chain issues, and I think that Mr. Ghosh in indicated that they're struggling with it with lead ammunition now. So 
uh, that is a piece of this whole puzzle that we'll have to put our heads together to work on. Uh, I think we're, we're at noon. So thank you, Mr. Chair. And thanks so much to all of the testifiers uh, for coming today. Thank you for presenting your bill and uh, members just keep an eye on your email for a notice about next week's hearing. Uh, that concludes the business before the committee today. And with that, we are adjourned.